Hey, Manufacturing World, welcome to another episode of Shop Matters, sponsored by Akuma America. This podcast is designed to talk about all things manufacturing related. Joining me today in the studio, I've got an old friend, John Tui with Fanuc America, and Dave Baldetti with Gosker Automation. Welcome, guys. Welcome, Wade. Thank you very much for having me again. Yeah, it's great to be here. All right. So, John, i got to share kind of a, a funny story, or, or a, to me, it's a, a funny story about you and why it's cool to know a lot of people in the industry in different parts of the country, but... Um, I don't know if you remember, but I had to move my father back home uh, with us from Arizona out to South Carolina. And me and my brother went out. He was driving a U-Haul, and I was driving my dad's car with my son, one of his friends. And driving along, I'm going through New Mexico, and you call me, and we're just shooting the breeze. And you want to know where I, you know, what I was doing. You could tell I was on the road. And I said, I'm driving through New Mexico at the moment. And you want to know how things were going. I said, actually, my eyes bother me a little bit. You know, I've got this really bad bloodshot eye going on and it just feels like somebody punched me. And like, dude, my dad and brother are eye doctors. Shoot me a picture. <laughs> so I sent a picture to you. You actually got me in contact with your brother who trouble shot my, my bad eye going down the road at 85 miles an hour and uh, told me basically to stop trying to be a hero and drive all the way by myself and let my son drive for a while. It was good that he could help diagnose your issue as you're driving down the expressway. I was happy we could help. <laughs> Anytime I think of fan, I guess that's, you know, always pops in my head. Come a long way from your bull riding days back when you were a kid. Uh, it used to be when you got there, that was the dangerous part, not the way down. Right. Yeah. Isn't that sad? I spent all those years driving, driving on road trips and now I can't do a simple road trip without something going wrong. I guess Getting old's not for the faint of heart, right? I have to stop every two hours when I take a road trip, so I feel your pain. So, guys, let's introduce each other. Tell, tell us a little bit about, as I'm getting tongue-tied, tell us a little bit about yourself. Dave, let's start with you. Okay. My name is Dave Aldete. Uh, as Wade mentioned, I work for uh, Gasker Automation, but I've really been with Gasker uh, for 20 years now. Uh, the first you know, 15 or so years, uh, spent a lot of time in our metal cutting group, you know, doing uh, turnkeys around North America. That's when I first met you. It was on a, a big right. turnkey project. That's right. Yep. Went all around, uh, you know, did a lot of things, uh, you know, a lot automotive in particular, but aerospace and other things too. You know, really learning, uh, you know, the machine tool world, metal cutting, manufacturing. And so, uh, you know, got my, you know, really kind of core of understanding that in those years. And then the last five years, I've been in uh, Gosker Automation, which is uh, a division within Gosker that focused entirely on, you know, uh, industrial automation, loading and unloading, primarily machine tool applications. And so, you know, we're, I think, I think we're experts on how to make parts uh, and also now, you know, how to load, you know, load, and unload those machine tools. Yeah. That's something, uh, you know, John, I think about the 15 years or so of making parts and the knowledge base that you learned from that and how to be able to apply that now from an automation standpoint. It's one thing to go in and look at things as just an automation expert, but to have that expertise of being able to do turnkeys and know what it actually takes to take raw material and ship out good parts has to be a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me again. I truly appreciate this, and I'm honored to be sitting here with you guys to uh, to discuss some of these topics. Tell us a little bit about your background, John. So my background, I've, I've been rooted in automation for uh, about the last 25 years. I spent my first years with, about 20 years with Shunk, where I concentrated on heavily on the automotive and eventually um, just the robot companies were my last four or five years where I dealt with just robot companies. And finally, Fanta came knocking on the door and IMTS 2016 and Lou Finazzo approached me and said, it's time you work for me. Decision was made like in a millisecond. And uh, I was able to join the FANUC team. Today, my role is a national account manager in the ASI group where I focus on machine tending and working on customers to develop the configurations from the machine tool to the robot. So uh, we have partners such as Gossager Automation that are very, very big partners in, uh, in our network. And I'm, again, honored to be here to talk about this with you guys. So, Dave, tell me a little bit about some of the type of projects that you got involved with uh, from the automation standpoint. I mean, what are some of the, how did you get started or how did Gosker Automation get started? Well, um, good question. Uh, you know, our, our origin is, you know, was the, was the guy who wanted to make a million or something. And so it was, you know, these big players, big projects, all custom. And, you know, we're, uh, it's the easy place, easiest place to justify automation where you're loading the same part over and over again. It required very little 
as far as uh, you know, high technology that is now available on robots and other things. Which the bulk of your territory, the the Gosker uh, trading ground, is in the automotive market, right? Indiana, yeah, right. right. We're, Michigan. We're, we're out of date in Ohio, but we cover, like you mentioned, uh, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana. You know, big time automotive uh, country, and so you know these are the low hanging fruit, if you will, of automotive opportunities where you have you know some part that's going to be made in the millions or uh, in that area, and and it's going to be one or two parts over and over again. And so that's that's where we started out, and that was where automation kind of was w- lived for you know I'd say in the 80s, 90s, and maybe even early 2000s. But over time, we started as technology uh, became more available, in particular with you know vision applications or functions on the robot like Torskip. We were able to you know move into the the mid level uh, customers who had you know mid level volumes, medium volumes, running lot sizes of 200, 300, 400 parts in a fairly broad mix. And we were able to pull that off, you know, by, again, by utilizing uh, vision so we didn't have to nest parts, not as mm-hmm. much hard tooling, create some flexibility. But still, we, were, we weren't, we really, you know, a, a candidate to, to offer much to the, to the smaller job shops that run volumes of of you know 50 20 40 parts with you know a huge variety of parts they don't even know what they're going to make you know next month much less six months from now uh so that's what the trend is now is is they have the same problems that the the big players have with you know high volumes this is the small shops mm-hmm. uh they can't get the the workers or they just want to be more efficient more productive and you know and so we've been really focused on on those small, uh, you know, job shop opportunities, and you know, really, the key uh, I think is creating simple to use, uh, you know, very affordable, and and you know, a really good return on investment uh, applications like our AWR product line. Mm-hmm. So that's what the you know that's where we're putting a lot of effort uh, these days. So tell us AWR. What is AWR? So AWR stands for automation within reach, and and what it is really is uh, you know is simple uh, automation, primarily focused to load you know lathes or machine tools, and it's it's for the small player who runs uh, you know he might only have two, three, five, ten pieces of equipment, uh, but he uh, and has la- large uh, mix but small volumes. Mm-hmm. So these uh, we have uh, a couple couple different products. We have a drawer cell, we have a rotary cell, and we have uh, what we call a VBX. Uh, in any case, they're they're built. Uh, you know, we we custom did all the design so that they're kind of out of the box solutions. They don't do everything, but they do you know what most people require. They pick parts, load them into lathes, unload them. You know, they can do some blow off, some other kind of things. But they're they're out of the box, built to stock, and and very affordable. And the key is, uh, at least to us, is that they're uh, very flexible and easy to use. Uh, no teach pendant or robot programming skills required. You know, we want somebody to be able to walk up uh, who has any comfort level uh, on the machine tool and, and be more comfortable with our automation. And so it has, you know, an HMI that, that walks the operator through how to set up part, uh, has automatic recoveries, you know, as much as can be done that's intuitive as possible. We feel like there's nobody who can run a CNC machine that won't be comfortable running one of our load and goes. And John, I think that's something that I know you and I have talked about in the past. Knowledge has a shelf life, right? So you can you can work, you get to a certain point where you've got a, a large set of knowledge and, and you think that's that's meaningful, and it is for a short period of time, but eventually technology will overtake that. If you don't continually improve your skill set, improve your knowledge base, Technology will pass you by, and and your that knowledge level is no longer um, as valuable as it once was. So I think it's interesting as we see technology like this grow. Uh, I think back to 20 years ago when I used to teach robots. Uh, to your point, I held a teach pendant. I had to teach each and every move that that robot made to get in and out of the machine and how to load parts and things of that nature. And utilizing the the technology that's available now, the connectivity and um, the simplicity of it now we've skill sets like what I once had on a shop floor isn't really needed right so I can put a, a load and go system in 
and within four hours have a machine loading parts and it's all conversational windows that's right you know uh the biggest obstacle when when you're selling automation to a customer oftentimes is they're afraid of it you know they don't want to create uh you know a problem where their employees you know don't want to run it or don't know how to run it and so you know we've we've tried to make it easy and i think Mm -hmm. we pulled that off so we're you know, really anybody uh, can go up and, and, and enter, you know, basic information, part diameters, uh, uh, you know, I'm OD clamping, I'm ID clamping, and then make it run. Right. Embracing the technology, right? Yeah, and in echoing Dave's statements, you know, when you, <coughs> automation was really coming out in the 80s and the automotive was pretty much the first one to deploy it in mass, it was dedicated automation where the robot would do one job, um, probably for the life of that machine. Today, automation has to be much more flexible to address the concerns that Dave brought up in terms of high volume and low mix, or low mix and high volume. Mm-hmm. Either way, the, the robot has to be able to adapt. And the technologies today and the software available to the robot makes it much more palatable and also cost effective to get involved in those high mix, low volume applications for the job shop level. Um, one of the challenging things we've been facing in the industry, though, is a lot of marketing is going out that is trying to portray robots as easy. So all of the robot manufacturers are quickly scrambling to develop ease of use interfaces to appease the market base that wants to make a robot easy. But one thing I would like to remind everybody, you know, a cobot, an under 10 kilogram machine that's inherently safe because it's force and power limited by design, that's one type of automation. But the marketing that goes along with it has also convinced the industry that robots are safe and easy. And in many cases, that can be dangerous and inherently just a bad idea to practice. You want to make sure that safeties are always taken care of, your interlocks and your machine is safe, and when the operator enters a workspace, that either the robot is aware of it or the robot has done a soft e-stop and shut down. And then secondly, you want to make sure that this robot, once it's safe, it's being used and applied properly. And using an integrator such as Gossiger, automation, you, you get a depth and breadth of knowledge along with that purchase of, of just an AWR. They have, as Dave was saying, 20 years experience just sitting next to me in robotic automation. So the importance of a robotic integrator in developing and taking advantage of the technologies uh, is, in my opinion, paramount. Mm-hmm. Moving forward, a lot of people say that I don't need an integrator. I've been watching these YouTube videos, and it's real easy to put the robot. The robot even opens the door. Holy cow. Well, the minute that person asks, can I, you need a robotic integrator. Can I put a camera? Can I put a conveyor? Can I, can I, can I? And the minute that you ask yourself, can I, call Gossiger. Right. The, the can I's are, are great. <laughs> I like a big <laughs> smile Dave's got. The can I's are, are great uh, tools, right? You know, yeah. can I do this? You, you never want to get pigeonholed into a situation where you say, well, we're making it this way because this is the way we've always made it you make that statement then there's meat on the bone there's ways to improve what you've been doing right because again technology is continuing to push the limits from even from a cutting tool standpoint Correct. right so if you're not embracing the technology you're going to wind up getting left behind so you got to continue to push the limits so the can eyes you want to encourage that you want to encourage people to go man i wonder can i make this robot do this one special thing and the chances are absolutely yeah and if you look at where we now, sit, how do we do it yeah and if you look where we sit wade you with Akuma, me with Fanuc, Dave with Gossiger Automation. We Akuma and Fanuc have amazing technology. Mm-hmm. Gossiger brings it together and creates a synergy between the technology of those two companies. And this is something you'll find with a robotic integrator in all applications. So if as you sit in your office deciding if you're going to automate a machine tool, one of the first things you should be deciding is which integrator you're going to select. Mm-hmm. Um, there are opportunities and there are possibilities that you can self-integrate. In many instances, and maybe Dave can expand on an example, that when you went out to deploy a piece of automation, it didn't work. You, all that money and time is spent when you could have contacted somebody to do this for you and draw on their experience. I don't know if Dave has any story he could recant. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, our load and go products, AWR products, are intended to be, you know, finished, polished products, you know, and, and we appreciate the the ease of use that you know uh, builders have have developed in their products, but there's a lot more that goes into an automated solution than just uh, you know a, a easy to program robot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there are all kinds of things that 
inherently create a robust process that makes the process able to be automated and, and run you know, consistently for long periods of, of time untended. And, and we've just learned that these things over the course of 20 years, you know, things like tool life control that you know, Akuma offers that needs to be turned on and operated. And the other things the operator might do, like uh, you know, blow off the fixture or uh, you know, identify parts that are you know, out of spec, too long, too short, that aren't right, uh, you know, uh, organize the picks so that way we have consistent picking, those kinds of things. And so that's, that's what we offer. And you know, I think uh, there's, a, there's a big difference between picking a part up and loading three in a row mm-hmm. or, or something like this and picking a part up and loading it on, uh, you know, for hours on end, days on end, weeks on end, 24 seven, lights out. And those are the things that, that we've gotten good at. Uh, you know, one of the things we offer, I think, just kind of the side part of you know any AWR opportunity is a checklist of things to to look for, uh, so that when we arrive, you know, it's ready to be to be automated. And those are things like I mentioned, you know, tool life management is turned on and, and working, and we're not relying on an operator to hear chatter or something developing in the process that might go wrong right because nobody wants to come in in the morning and find out that we made parts all night long but they're all bad right uh, and you know there's there's countless other things you know of course the interface you know we have developed interfaces over years and so we know that they're, they're safe and robust and just getting uh, a robot to open a door and push cycle start is not the same thing as having a safe and robust process because sooner or later you're going to find out that the machine tool and robot didn't interact well and somebody's unhappy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I think that those are the, you know the kind of things we bring uh, to the table that a DIYer might not know. Right. I know uh, Greg used to say that with automation we make a lot of parts. Now we can make parts good or make parts bad. And the process ahead of that stream is what's going to determine that and how do you catch it. So those are all good points. And those are life lessons that, you know, I kind of bring back to your previous experience of spending 15 years as an engineer designing processes on how to make parts plays a huge advantage on, okay, now how do we automate that process? So you have to know how to make good parts and make them consistently to be able to automate it so that your automation is sound and bulletproof. Yeah, just just moving the part from point A to point B is probably the easy part. That's right? the simple part. That's right? the easy part. You know, doing it uh, and knowing what kind of proper work holding we should have that is robust enough to handle variations and and slugs or saw cut parts or castings or forgings, and you know what kind of metal cutting process includes the proper blow offs or wash offs or tool life monitoring or whatever is required that when you walk away, you can be sure when you come back hours later or days later that it's still running. Mm -hmm. Now, the load and go systems, as as we talk about having something that is robust and uh, capable and being able to monitor what's taking place in your manufacturing process, I know you guys are doing some things with cameras now, correct? Sure. We we install, we have a couple things. We install an EWAN unit, which allows us to uh, interrogate, you know, remotely, any kind of the inputs and outputs that are going on. So if something's happening, you know, that is odd or bizarre, we can look at it remotely anytime and, uh, you know, potentially uh, create a fix. Mm -hmm. And then also we install on our systems a camera. Uh, And that's, you know, as much as anything else, it's a, it's a, it's a tool for the customer to, to check and see that his unit's running when he's out. Right. So we want as much as we can, we want to have uh, customers have untended, times, you know, particular on, on tended shifts, off shifts, you know, nights and weekends. And so they can monitor just, you know, where am I at in my queue? Am I getting near the end of my queue? And I should send somebody in to put, you know, new raw parts in and replace them, uh, you know, get rid of the, uh, move the finished parts out? Or is there a fault for some reason or other? Mm-hmm. We found, I, I think I mentioned that we found a, a, an unusual uh, a scenario at a customer in, in Iowa, as it turned out, where uh, they would run great all day long. They'd run and they had no faults. The robot just never stopped. And then uh, they had set it up to run overnight and they'd come in inevitably in the morning. They'd find that it stopped some point in the middle of the night and did not know why. Uh, and so we we did all manner of trying to figure out what happened and, and ultimately sent somebody out on site. And we found that, um, uh, so I should lead, all our uh, uh, 
load and goes are, are guarded with an area scanner. Hmm. It allows great ergonomics. Uh, it has just it just uh, allows me to walk in. It interrupts a, a, a a light curtain, and then you can reset that start. So it's a it's a safety mechanism that's uh, RIA certified, but uh, very user friendly. However, apparently it's prone to have a uh, insect or moth, as in this case, uh, inter- interrupt that. So what was happening? This customer was they'd turn everything off at night except for the control of the, of the load and go, and they would open a uh, a door in the back because they wanted to keep the shop cool. And uh, and moss would fly in, and they'd be attracted to the light of the attracted to the control light. <laughs> <laughs> oh my yes. gosh! <laughs> and they were just floating around and large enough that our area scanner would detect them and, and alarm out for a safety uh, situation. And so it wasn't until we saw it firsthand, and then we just changed some settings on the uh, area scanner, and away we went. But uh, that was, you know, one of those things that I think. Uh, you learn uh, and move on. Who would have believed production was stopped by a moth? A, a true form of uh, <laughs> collaboration right there, a collaborative robot. So actually, in, in the scenario that, that Dave has suggested or described, that robot is actually collaborative. Hmm. Um, it is in a form of collaboration called speed and separation monitoring. So in the load-and-go cell, they do have an area scanner so that if an operator walks into this area, the robot is well aware of his presence. And um, if he ent- ent- enters zone one, the robot will decrease its velocity by 50%. If they enter the working area of the robot, the robot will do a soft e-stop until that um, person is removed from the zone. Mm-hmm. Or so, a moth. Or a moth in this case. <laughs> <laughs> but the beautiful thing about it is, is what Gossiker is able to do using other forms of collaboration, and he referenced the RIA specifications. In this case, it's 15066. Uh, T1, 2, and 3, uh, they address the types of forms of collaboration and speed and separation monitoring, in which the load and go uh, definitely exemplifies, is that form of collaborative. So when customers go out and they say, we want a collaborative robot, well, they have in their mind what they think a collaborative robot is, but what a collaborative robot really is is something that's force and power limited, speed and separation monitoring, uh, hand guidance, and there's one other form that right now is escaping me off the top of my head, but as long as you meet one of these classifications, which Gossiker does, you have a collaborative robot and can also, many companies have initiatives to deploy collaborative robots. Hmm. Educating our customer base on what collaborative robots truly are, I think is also very important. When we look at you know, a company that has, wants to put a big, big robot but doesn't want to put fencing, mm-hmm. we can still make that big robot collaborative, whether it's Gossiker does it or another one of our partners. So educating our customer base on what collaboration truly is, uh, I think will help us in the long run deploy the automation properly. Because today in the collaborative space, uh, I I saw a statistic from the RIA, and I don't want to quote a number that is not accurate, but it was a very low number of actual cobots that are deployed in actual collaborative applications. Hmm. Most cobots today are deployed in applications that were sold as an ease of use, not collaborative. Hmm. Okay, very interesting. We think we've been uh, selling collaborative solutions for years. And what I mean by that is, you know, what we're trying to do is create uh, an automated solution where the operator can intervene when he's needed to do so. And oftentimes there are those scenarios, we'll say a tool change or, uh, you know, part changeover. And so we, we have created, you know, fencing scenarios where if we have a robot uh, servicing two machines, we'll allow you to go in and, and uh, change tools of one machine while the robot's running the other machine. Mm-hmm. And so I would call these, you know, these are forms of collaboration in the sense that we're allowing the human to do the things he needs to do and and be safe and the robot to continue running automatically. So, you know, we've done that uh, with fencing, we've done that with light curtains, we've done that with uh, area scanners, we'll do that with real collaborative robots, uh, but, you know, creating scenarios where we can run uh, automation uh, safely and have the operator be able to do his things is what we've been doing for, you know, some time. And as I sit here, that fourth form of collaboration was safety rated stop. Sorry, that slipped my mind a moment ago. <laughs> I hate that when it pops in your head and you're like, oh, damn, I I'm just impressed <laughs> how fast you're able to, to rattle through all those specs. Yes. So, yeah, I think the, the safety aspect, that's an interesting talking point all to itself on having the experience levels needed to be able to safely uh, have the, the correct environment for the automation to go in. I recall several years ago, it was probably – IMTS, maybe 06, somewhere around that time frame, we brought a grinder in. And uh, it was Mark Eddy uh, was involved back then and uh, designed a, a really neat clamshell-style front door. 
It was super fast. Only a piece of the door would open up in a clamshell style. The robot would reach in, get the parts in and out, and it was lightning fast how the whole system worked. It was amazing. And that worked well for most of the markets in the United States. But a customer in Canada bought that system Mm -hmm. and sent the machine. You probably remember this, Dave. Sent the machine up to Canada, and the CSA guys go in to inspect it. They're like, oh, you can't have a door like that up here. Turns out that clamshell-style door presents a pinch point problem. So even though it was meant to be a automated solution, nobody was really thinking to the to the point of, hey, there could be an instant where that door is open, something stops, and a guy goes to reach in, and that door could close. Now he's got a pinch point. That that's a hard lesson learned, right? Sure. Um, we had to we had to scrap a very unique, very cool door that was custom built for that scenario. We had to throw it in the trash can, start over, and put the old traditional auto door mechanism on it that slid left to right and and had rubber uh, safety switches and things like that. But those are lessons learned that you know you 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 need to rely on the expertise of the people who have been there, done that, have the battle scars to prove it, and you're not reliving and relearning those lessons over and over. Very so, true. If you look at the situation where robots are deployed inappropriately, mm-hmm. um, the satisfaction levels just fall through the floor. An integrator will always bring their level of expertise. And in this case with Dave, we've got 20 years of expertise. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure how long the akuma uh, Gossiger relationship has been About in place. 35. 35 years. So they've got 35 years of experience with the Akuma machines and the Akuma platforms. It would be foolish to not talk to them if you're going to deploy automation on an Akuma machine. It would be that should be your first step, the mindset of contact Gossick or contact your integrator to make sure you don't waste time and money down the road. Right. I think too of Thank some of the <laughs> I think of some of the employees that uh, you know Gossiker Automation's got, guys like Dave Baldetti and uh, you know, even Jimmy Brown, you know, I, we have people who are OSP experts that reach out to Jimmy to pick his brain on mm-hmm. things because he is so entrenched and has such an in-depth knowledge on uh, you know everything from how the APIs work, not only on the Akuma, but all the different various peripheral devices um, that you, you typically wind up interfacing with at some point in an automated solution. Yeah, even in a job shop, if you think about a job shop that has 10 machines, he may have 10 different different manufacturers. Well, that mapping that robot to that PMC in a true integration is not an easy task. An integrator has those experiences. But if your intent is just to plop a robot and let it open a door and hit a cycle start button, it'll work for a while, but that's not a true robot integration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, to be honest, we don't even think about those things anymore because it's so second nature to us. You know, we've been just doing it for so long, and so yeah. I can I, I don't know how many Akumos we've put a robot in front of, but it's it's in the if it's not thousand, it's it's in the many hundreds, and so we just all our guys can do it, you know, and and we're very comfortable with it and how it works and. Second nature to us, I guess. Yeah. I always like the famous line. Uh, Craig Cottrell uh, says it a lot when, when customers come up and they have a question about something. He'll always start, yes, now what's your question? You know, th- there's a way to do it. There, there's experience level out there. There's openness of the control. And, and there's so many different engineered solutions that we've come across over the years. Chances are, whatever your unique situation is that, that you think you're the only guy that's ever experienced it, Chances are we've experienced it in different areas. Uh, it might not be the exact same scenario, but it's close enough we can draw off those experiences to develop custom solutions for you. And the robotic integrator is going to be the one that's going to have that experience to provide those solutions. You know, as you sit here with Akuma and me with Fanic, we're, again, two great companies on their mm-hmm. own. But if we were going to try to work together to do direct integration, we would be missing all of the experience that Gossiger has brought to the table for the past 35 years. So whether you're new at this or whether you've got 35 years experience, drawing on the experience from a robotic integrator will only benefit your bottom line. Yep. Guys, any, any topics that I might have missed? Any but, key things you want to bring up? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. I would, I would say that, you know, one of the evolutions you mentioned new 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 developments going on, and one of the things I think it is is, you know, I've kind of said it before, but I'll say it a little differently this time is, you know, previously, everything we did was a custom 
project, right? So, right. you know, a way to Anderson would call me and say, I want to do this and I want to do that. And I'm, and I have this contract and, and we could build and still can anything you can imagine. And there's cost to that. That's fine. We could do all that stuff, you know? And so now we're moving towards, uh, you know, standard products mm-hmm. uh, that have, that can be, you know, customized to fit your needs. So if I make a comparison, you know, in the old days, we were building custom cars like they did in the early 1900s. And today, you know, you're going into the shop or to the, to the car dealership and you're picking a car you want and you're customizing it to have the features you need. Mm-hmm. And so that allows us to take the advantages of, of building in volume, amortizing engineering and experience over, you know, years and getting, you know, the everyday man automation like like Henry Ford did on the Model T. I, that's what I think we're heading. Uh, at least we're heading that way, and I think we'll get there. Excellent. From the Fanuc perspective, of course, we, we've uh, released our new CRX collaborative robot. We also have some software coming down that's going to address some of the ease of use and interfaces from the robot to a Fanuc controlled machine. Those those will be probably be released within the next quarter. Um, some of these ease of use features could actually include programming the robot in G-code as it sits next to the machine tool. And this will apply to not just our CRX robot, but to any robot in the FANUC family. So moving forward, the idea to put the right robot in front of the machine tool with ease of use functions, potentially programmed in G-code, so the operator is intimidated and doesn't think that this thing's here to re- replace his job, it's here to augment it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> So those are many of the initiatives that we're going to be see pushing forward in 21. But I have to ask you, what does Akuma have coming down the road in 2021? We got, we got a lot of great stuff. So um, we're doing a lot more work uh, with technology from the double column standpoint. So uh, we do a lot with surfacing. Uh, our new hypersurface uh, features is something that we're just scratching the surface on with the mold and die type applications. <laughs> so yeah, we've got a new machine coming out that is targeting the semiconductor um, industry, um, but that same machine um, is has got all the features and functions and hypersurfacing and everything to target my mold and die type industries as well. Um, and then obviously the automation aspect, pretty much all new Okuma machines are designed with automation in mind. So. Uh, I, I think we made big strides with the de- design and implementation on the MU five axis machines with a simple thing of taking basically the same construction, turning the trunnion 90 degrees. So, and I think Dave brought it up about having an operator to have access and being able to interface with the machine with that MU with the trunnion turned, all the robots, all the APCs, FMS systems, anything you want to incorporate from an automation standpoint can go in from the back of the machine operator still has full access to the front. So we're doing a lot more uh, work in that area. You're going to see some new things coming out with VTLs um, with some very unique features to make them automation friendly as well. So basically all the new designs as we move forward start first with strength, thermal stability, and then automation. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of the three steps we'll make sure we look for. And then what about a fourth step like data? Data. That's that's a. We actually just <laughs> recorded a, a podcast based around that. So, the OSP P series control um, has access to about nine thousand data Different points. Tags, yeah. So it's incredible the amount of data you can extract from a machine. The important part, though, is not you know don't get enamored by how much data you can pull. It's how do you find what's meaningful to your process, Correct. and that's where a lot of focus and attention is is placed. Uh, we partner with companies like Premo, uh, who is an AI uh, company that goes in and looks at the data, looks at the raw data, and then starts identifying anomalies to say, wait a minute, at three o'clock in the afternoon, every day, you got a weird lull in your production. You know, something happens and you can start unraveling that to find out, oh, guess what? We keep running out of ro- way lube oil at 245 or, you know, I'm just kind of making yeah. up a scenario. But you can identify those anomalies in your production process to be able to get ahead of it. And, and again, that, that's important from an automation standpoint, right? For sure. We yeah. want to set these things up so they can run lights out unattended. Well, you can't do that if you've got something in your process that creates a bottleneck. Yeah, as my uh, earlier uh, example of the moth, you know, uh, we figured that out, but it was it was through the old-fashioned way. We had people there, and we kind of mm-hmm. monitor it. And, and one of the things we've incorporated now is uh, the area scanner logs 
and records what happens. So we can go back and look in time what happens. So right. we can see if somebody wanders through there just seeing what's going on and causes a stop or a cat or whatever it is that might stop something. We will now be able to see. And so that's the same. Just it's just data ways mm-hmm. to research, you know, research what happened and hopefully, you know, create a fix. Yeah. yeah. And from a FANUC perspective, depending on what your IOT initiatives are for your plant, your factory floor, we have a product called ZDT, which is an acronym for zero downtime. And originally this software was developed in conjunction with General Motors to eliminate downtime. You know, they, they may have on a specific plant a couple hundred robots deployed, and if one goes down, mm-hmm. the whole plant shuts down. Mm-hmm. So General Motors drove us to develop a kinematic for us to start to research how the robot is performing in operation. So when we first came up with this product, it's about eight years old now, when we first came up with this product, we were able to detect failures two and three days in advance, which was revolutionary at the time. We've developed the kinematic to such a refined point that I can predict failures in a, of a joint six months in advance. Wow. by detecting those statistical anomalies that we're looking at on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. And what this allows the customer to do, and, and in conversations we've had, ZDT, in my opinion, needs to be rebranded as an OEE monitor because I can extrapolate information from the cell as how is the robot performing? What is the robot doing? Has there been a change? Many of the things we find and a lot of times, second shift comes in and says, you know, I don't like this point. I'm going to touch it up. First shift come back in and the whole thing is all messed up. ZDT tracks all those changes. So you can go back to the previous version of that software, the program, excuse me, to run that program to run those parts and then have your conversation with the second shift guy. Why did he do that? But the point being is, is everything is logged. We use data to really drive our manufacturing decisions, even with the robot. And then plus, one of the objections we get, and not objections, but one of the comments we get all the time about ZDT is, why do I need it? Your robots don't fail. Well, it's not so much about failure and it is as as it is about understanding that OEE information as to how the robot is performing in your process mm-hmm. um, and then improving that if necessary. Excellent. Well, guys, I think we're running into our time stop here. So I really appreciate the time you guys spent and uh, the insights you brought to the table from the, just everything from automation to the manufacturing process as a whole. So thank you for your time today. Oh, thank you, Wade. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for having us. I really appreciate the products you guys sell and you guys sell it really help us put together good solutions i think and without you they wouldn't be put together well thank you partnerships <laughs> all right and everybody listening thank you for your time today if you've got thoughts ideas questions uh, ideas for future podcasts please hit us up on the akuma website you can find me on linkedin as well until then we'll see you next time thanks thank guys. you everybody thanks